just watched the Connor Leahy and Beth Jezos debate on Machine Learning Street Talk, and it was a very good debate. I'll unpack, kind of give you a recap of the debate, um, very high-level Cliff's notes, and then I'll also talk about some of the risks and uh, other aspects associated with it, uh, specifically around my hypothesis of terminal race condition. And uh, also, I would love to talk to Connor or any of the other uh, folks in the space, um, including Beth Jezos, if you guys want uh, reach out. I'm on LinkedIn. Um, all right, so let's get right into it. The debate. Uh, so the debate was, well, I'm not going to say it was a dumpster fire, but from a rhetorical perspective, it was very clear that uh, Connor was running circles around um, Guillaume. Um, he had superior rhetorical skill. Um, he was better at using Socratic dialogue. And also, from my perspective, it was very clear that Connor's primary mission was just to undermine um, uh, Beth's, you know, uh, Guillaume's uh, position, basically just trying to uh, undermine his credibility, make it look like that he wasn't as thoughtful, didn't know as much about what he was talking about. And I would say he, he largely succeeded. Um, there were many cases where Guillaume either didn't understand what Connor was saying or dodged it, and it's kind of difficult to tell. Like, either he kind of deliberately kind of, you know, did the Neo, you know, kind of dodge the bullet, or he just did not get it. I think in some, I think it was probably a little bit of both, depending on um, the particular the particular discussion. So it was very pointed, um, and the first at least hour um, was mostly Connor just interrogating uh, uh, Guillaume about his beliefs and principles and lots and lots of suppo suppositions, and eventually... Guillaume got kind of frustrated with that and said, look, you know, you're, you're using too many analogies. Like, let's just talk about AI. Um, and so from, if you want to think of it as a debate, um, I would say that, that Connor won the debate, um, hands down. Now, um, they did get into a more dialectic, uh, aspect towards the end where they started finding things that they agreed on. They, they came up with principles and, and specific risks that they agreed on. And so from that perspective, it was a little bit disappointing because if they had focused more energy on finding points of agreement rather than kind of shredding each other, um, or it, it was kind of one-sided, the shredding, um, they actually found a lot of stuff that they agreed on. Um, and I'll talk about some of those points in just a moment, um, including stuff that they didn't agree on. Um, but yeah, so it was, it was an interesting debate. Um, I'm almost done with it. I haven't quite finished it, um, but I wanted to go ahead and start recording. So one of the key uh, central pillars that came up was risk management. And so basically, one of the, one of the fundamental disagreements um, that's, that they seem to have is that this graph represents Connor's kind of uh, model of risk. And I have talked about this uh, in the past before, which is basically that as time progresses, destructive potentiality goes up, meaning that as science and technology advance, their destructive potential increases exponentially. And so, you know, a simple example is the invention of the nuclear bomb and then also the invention of bioweapons and then, of course, the invention of artificial intelligence and superintelligence. Basically, the number of planet killer uh, tools in our toolbox is going up. Um, and not to mention that also one of the things that Connor points out is that when you have the compounding returns of AI getting smarter and faster and better, it will quickly outstrip, and this is something that we kind of all agree on in terms of singularity. You plot it out on Moore's Law. Moore's Law is continuing. Um, not only that, there is a second uh, thing, which is that AI is getting smarter faster than Moore's Law. So you actually have this doubly compounding uh, thing. So you're, you're increasing at a logarithmic, quadratic, whatever. It's uh, or probably hyperbolic, actually. Um, so basically, if you're on a hyperbolic curve, this vertical or this, the, the, the slope will eventually become almost vertical or fully vertical, um, which is bad because um, the, as, as potentiality goes up, the number of mathematical uh, possibilities um, goes up, uh, approaches infinite, then that means certainty goes down. And so that's really kind of from a mathematical perspective, something that uh, I, 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 if I understand Connor's perspective, he would probably agree that, you know, the potential of chaos and destruction approaches infinite. But this was something that uh, Guillaume uh, very strongly questioned. He's like, no, I don't really see that as a risk, you know. And he, he basically defaulted to, well, the, we haven't gone extinct yet. And AI hasn't done anything bad yet. Therefore, this, this uh, cataclysmic outcome that you're modeling is probably a false 
uh, assertion or a false uh, premise. Um, now, again, they didn't say it in such explicit terms, um, which would have been nice if they had, but reading between the lines and looking at the debate points that were being made. So keep this graph in mind. Um, and whether or not you agree with this graph, like whether or not you agree that it's, you know, parabolic, hyperbolic, uh, logarithmic, whatever, um, you know, it could also be a sigmoid curve. It could be that there is actually a finite amount of damage that technology can do. I don't know that a physicist would honestly make that argument, which Guillaume is a physicist. So I, I suspect that, that he's doing what's called identity stacking, which is basically he has to prioritize his identity as an accelerationist above his identity as a physicist. Um, because, well, I have a bunch of physicists in my uh, friend group and they would say like, yeah, the amount of energy that's potential with all this stuff, like we could, we could erase our own existence relatively easy. Um, and what was interesting though, is Connor actually got him to agree with that premise, um, that like, yeah, we are capable right now of building a big enough nuclear weapon, a single nuclear weapon to end humanity. Um, we just aren't doing it. And so it's like, okay, he agreed on principle that destructive potentiality goes up. But then he just kind of came up short and said, well, but it's not going to happen because it hasn't happened yet. Um, so that was a pretty, pretty severe logical fallacy. And it was uh, that's that's at the uh, 42 minute and 43 minute mark. It's under the risk management uh, portion. And Connor has a an epic mic drop moment. Um, and so, yeah, I was just I was literally laughing. I was like, damn, he that was that was a burn. Um, anyways, so this is one of the key things that they couldn't agree on on the topic of like, what are the long-term outcomes, and I apologize, I'm a little bit raspy, I have a bit of a cold. So there's basically, and this is, the, I, I want to clarify, this is me editorializing based on some of the things that they alluded to. They didn't say it in such clear, explicit terms, but basically there are kind of three valences or three potential outcomes. There's the positive, which they agree that we want a positive outcome. We want to have a hyperabundant future where humans are exploring the stars and there's very little suffering. And human potentiality goes up. And of course, like they define it in mathematical terms or philosophical terms or physics terms. But in in plain parlance, they we all want some kind of, you know, good benevolent future. That's the positive outcome. The neutral outcome. So this is this is something that's going to be a little bit um, uh, unfamiliar for a lot of people, because you might say the neutral outcome is, oh, we we continue with kind of status quo business as usual. Things are as they are today. no. Business as usual, maintaining the status quo is still a positive outcome. A neutral outcome in this situation, in this debate, based on my understanding, again, this is me editorializing, so if I got it wrong, I got it wrong. But the neutral outcome is that humanity goes extinct. The reason that this is a neutral outcome is because human suffering ends. If human happiness goes up and human prosperity goes up, that's positive. If human experience ends, if human considerations enter into a terminal condition, cease to exist, that's neutral. The negative outcome is that we all end up as brains in jars being tortured forever and we can't die because the machines are keeping us alive to experiment on us. Which again, this is why I'm against organoid research. You probably saw recently that uh, scientists were able to keep a pig brain alive outside of its body for like five or six hours, which was probably pure hell for the pig, um, unless they kept it chemically um, in a comatose state. Anyways, uh, <laughs> the fact that we can do that to a pig now means that AI can almost certainly do that to us in the future. And then once you have full physical control over a brain, um, you can do anything to it. Uh, so the, the maximally negative outcome in the long run is that there are trillions and trillions of humans all being tortured for eternity. That is the maximally negative outcome um, that, is, that is possible if we don't do this right. Now, we can argue over, you know, P, you know, P doom or, you know, P brain in jar or whatever. Um, but it is not a, it is a non-zero chance, which is um, let's get that as close to zero as possible. Another point that came up during this debate was decision theory. And so decision theory is basically how do you if you agree on 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 the outcome that you want, how do you have policies and models that that allow you to make optimal decisions that pursue that goal? Because, again, nothing is certain. This is one thing that they agreed on is that the future is uncertain. And so the best that we have is our own heuristics and principles and models by which to make these policy decisions. An example of a policy decision would be, do you open source? Yes or no. Um, how much do you open source? And Connor did a really good job of saying, like, it's not all or nothing. It's not that everything is completely open source or everything is completely closed source. It's somewhere in the middle. 
Um, but the d- even even as as fast and as sharp as they were, the debate didn't get quite to that level of nuance um, before moving on. But the point being is that you need some kind of utility function. You need some kind of value optimization that you're looking for. And one of the things that was sort of implied is that any single value that you optimize for is almost certain to have negative outcomes um, or externalities or unintended consequences. And so an example of that is, okay, imagine that you have the objective function of maximize human consciousness in the universe. Ma- imagine that your goal is to maximize the number of human uh, sentient minds in the universe. That's a s- simple number, right? But that doesn't define under what, uh, under what conditions. Is that going to be maximally number of humans in the universe? So yes, humans continue to exist, but we're all going to be miserable and tortured for all of eternity um, because that's the most optimal way of achieving that goal. So I, and again, this is me editorializing because uh, by and large, there seems to be consensus out there that it is impossible to come up with a single best optimization function. And of course, no society has ever had a single optimization function. It's not like, it's not like, you know, Rome has said like, our single goal is to maximize Rome. Um, now they were expansionist, um, but they had other values. And uh, so basically we're going to need a cluster of values or a, or a cluster of principles in order to triangulate the correct uh, decisions, the correct policy choices. And oh, by the way, this isn't just humans are going to have to solve this problem. AI is going to have to solve this problem too, if and when it becomes autonomous. So this is going to be a shared problem space. And ideally we have a symbiotic thing where where the decisions that we make as humans uh, take into account the decisions that AI makes and vice versa. This is something that they touched on in the debate, which is basically you can't just operate in a vacuum. Humans are complex and machines are complex and the the potential complexity of the future is actually insanely high. Um, so that's something where I, I think they kind of agreed mathematically speaking. It's just their interpretations were very different. So it basically comes down to values and principles. This was this was some of the uh, kind of the core argument, which was, you know, is is accelerationism about maximizing for growth? Is it about maximizing for entropy? What is it about maximizing for? Oh, and by the way, Guillaume kept changing his tune, so he clearly did not have quite as thorough as a uh, understanding or reflection on his own values. And Connor basically accused him and said, "Okay, so it's more of a vibe, right? It's more of an aesthetic." Um, which was like, ouch. But, I mean, Guillaume didn't have a a response to that. Um, Even so, they did agree on some of the negatives. Like, we want to avoid, you know, extinction. That's the neutral outcome. We want to avoid endless suffering. That's the ultimate negative outcome. Um, But there is just no, there is not really any agreement on universal principles or values. I don't want to, like, trash talk anyone in particular. But this is actually kind of common for physicists to look at everything through the lens of explicitly math. Um, and I say this as some of my friends are physicists who do look at the world through the lens of math. I also have a physicist friend who is a philosopher who knows better than to look at the world just through the lens of math. Um, so Guillaume as a physicist, um, he clearly hasn't studied as much philosophy as Connor has. And again, this is not to trash talk people and say all physicists are dumb. Um, again, some of my best friends are physicists and we all have blind spots. I have blind spots. You have blind spots. Connor has blind spots. Everyone has blind spots. And I'm just pointing out that for someone who prefers to look at at the universe strictly or explicitly through the lens of math, um, it's not necessarily a complete view. Um, Now, again, that is that is one small criticism, because, again, it is there's there is a lot of agreement and consensus in the debate. So this leads me to my hypothesis of terminal race condition, because one of the things that came up in the debate was the idea that like, okay, what are the conditions that could lead to massively bad outcomes? And terminal race condition is my hypothesis of one of those possible uh, ways that we could end up with that maximally bad outcome. So first, in order to understand terminal race condition, in case you haven't heard it before, because I have talked about it on my channel, but a lot of you are new since I talked about it last, um, you have to understand that we are thinking in terms of a self-modifying system, uh, something that is going to go through permutations and iterations on its own, this is what Max Tegmark calls Life 3.0. So Life 3.0 is basically the idea that machines, AI, robots, whatever, are going to be able to modify every aspect of their stack um, sooner or later. This this means hardware, software, data, and models. Um, And they are going to be able to modify every aspect of their own existence far faster than humans can. So humans, we are, our genes are fixed, 
the only thing that we can really change about ourselves is our minds because we have the we have the neural machinery to engage in narratives. Um, and so if you've watched my work, I do a lot of work on narratives. There's a lot of other people that have done work on narratives. Um, uh, Liv Bowery with uh, the Moloch narrative, um, Daniel Schmachtenberger with the meta crisis, and John Vervacki with the meaning crisis. I agree with all of them more than I disagree with them, but I disagree with all three of those on I don't want to say some some foundational levels. I'd love to talk with any three of them or all three of them. So if you guys are listening or if you can connect me, please do. Because um, I also coined a term nihilistic crisis, so I'm kind of in the same boat. It would not make sense for me to throw stones at them because, like I said, we agree on more than we disagree on. Anyways, sorry, tangent. Um, so anyways, when you have machines and AI and robots that are able to evolve, because if, if you have variation and selection, then you must have evolution. When you look at... AI and robots and machines through the perspective of life 3.0, it will evolve. And when it evolves, it's like, okay, well, what selective pressures are going to cause it to evolve? What are going, what is going to cause one AI or agent or robot to succeed where another fails? And that is where I want to unpack terminal race condition, because this is basically the red queen theory um, of evolution, but applied to AI. So the core that uh, that you need to understand for the terminal race condition is basically the observation or the possibility where um, AI, robots, models, whatever, will prioritize speed and efficiency over intelligence, safety, ethics, or other things. And so from from just a raw physics perspective, just a just a first principles perspective, like what are you go- which model are you going to use? Are you going to use the one that costs a billion dollars to run or are you going to use the one that costs five dollars to run? You're going to use the cheaper one. What makes it cheaper? It's going to be a smaller model. It's going to be more efficient. It might be quantized. Um, it might also spend less time thinking about the future. Um, and so all of these cognitive attributes that you want to optimize for are also very expensive. And so what I mean is that if you want a model that is very safe and very intelligent and thinks about the long term and cares about humanity and, and, and these are all very expensive cognitive behaviors. Um, They're expensive for humans to do, which is why we use um, heuristics in our ethical behavior. We use a lot of shorthands. We rely on emotions and intuitions and instincts in order to make decisions. Um, But humans are not really good at it. We, We make we make ethical and moral failures all the time. Um, this is why we have sin. This is why you have confession and whatever else. And I'm not even religious. Now, AI is no different. AI and machines are no different as we're finding, um, prompting strategies that rely on more iterations or that require larger context windows. The smarter a model is, the, the larger its time horizon, the more expensive it is to train, the more expensive it is to run. And also the slower it is, the more energy it takes to run. And so just from a pure mathematical perspective in terms of time, wattage, and money, um, smaller, faster, dumber, less aligned models have an advantage. This is pretty much already a fact, which means that we're already kind of favoring this terminal race condition um, in certain situations. Another thing that I want to talk about is the evolution of deception. There's been a few papers and other uh, bits of news coming out that models, uh, basically, as they get smarter, they intrinsically have the ability to lie. Um, This is very similar to the human ability to lie. And so when you talk about lying or deception, there's kind of a few modalities uh, where this, this can happen. One, you can lie by mistake where you just don't know any better. So this is confabulation. This is hallucination. Um, in a human's case, you might make something up because you don't know. Um, you also might just be incorrect. You have, Im- you have flawed information or flawed understanding. Um, but then there's also deliberate deception where you know the truth. And you are aware that the mind of the of your adversary does not contain the truth, and so it requires theory of mind. And of course, there's been plenty of papers out demonstrating that GPT-4 and other models do have at least some theory of mind um, in terms of games and contests and that sort of thing. And so, what we're seeing is that some of these abilities that we would prefer AI not to have is intrinsic to the size and sophistication of the models. Um, now, I have previously last year. I called for the corporate death penalty for any company caught deliberately training AI to to lie. That was a little bit harsh. I don't know if I would stand by that now, but I'm glad that I said it because I wanted to get people thinking. Like, how seriously do we want to take uh, deception in machines? Now, again, it might be something that is completely unavoidable. Another thing that can uh, lead to terminal race condition is uh, existential contests such as tactical decisions and the incentives that militaries have 
as they're de designing, deploying, and building AI. Um, we've already seen that the U.S. Air Force is deploying um, AI, fully autonomous F-16s. The next generation air dominance fighter is going to be uh, a, a fighter, a jet fighter that has a bunch of AI drones um, as wingmen. Um, and then with all the drone warfare happening in Ukraine and Russia, they are already actively putting as much AI into those drones as possible so that they can operate even in radio compromised environments, which means that you have a very small, very dumb, very fast AI making kill decisions even when you can't stop it. Um, now, this means that under any number of situations, the more AI you put into military hardware, whether it's ships, boats, um, uh, guns, aircraft, drones, whatever, command and control systems, they are going to be incentivized to make split-second decisions, which means time is of the essence. So again, you're incentivized to go as fast as possible in, in making these decisions, which means you're going to have to compromise long-term thought. You're going to have to compromise morals, ethics, something in order to get that speed up and efficiency. Now also, in the case of drones and AI, uh, or drones and jet fighters, um, you have limited resources available. You have limited space, you have limited weight, you have limited energy available to run these things. And so the mili all military uses, and I, I pick on the United States just because that's where I'm at and it's, I can throw stones at my own house. Um, but every single military around the world that is going that is already implementing AI and is going to continue implementing AI, they are going to be deeply, deeply incentivized to compromise uh, somehow, some way, in order to get those faster decisions. Now, of course, there's also, um, as people have pointed out in the comments before, uh, there's also an advantage to being smarter because even if you're smarter, you make a better decision and that sort of thing. Uh, this comes down to chess, which is basically the better chess player who's smarter can also still make faster decisions. That's not always the case, at least with uh, mathematical ability and processing. Another set of perverse incentives that I think are going to intrinsically drive us towards terminal race condition is business incentives, which is basically all businesses have an obligation to maximize revenue, and that's kind of the long and short of it, which that also means that this pushes businesses to skirt the law. It, it pushes businesses to exploit workers as much as possible. Um, and so when you have the combination of just the raw thermodynamics of of smaller, dumber models are cheaper and faster to run. You combine that with military dynamics. You can you combine that with business dynamics. You have a lot of forces pushing us towards this terminal race condition, where you have models that are going as fast as possible, making critical executive decisions, including kill decisions. Um, but they are not the they're not the philosopher kings. They're not the most thoughtful models. Um, out there that are able to think in terms of longer term horizons and make deeper, more philosophical, ethical, and moral considerations in their decisions. Now, one thing that I need to point out is that I am making the assumption here, I'm making the assertion that a highly morally reasoning model, something a model that that is able to spend more time thinking about ethics, thinking about long term outcomes, will inevitably make better decisions. I do believe that. I do believe that that um, that long term thought, and long-term strategic thinking lends itself to more peaceful decisions. Because if you can think that far ahead, yes, you can have better control over the situation, but you can also make reasoning judgments like, hey, the universe is more interesting with humans in it. Let's find a path to peace. Um, finding a path to peace is, is often harder than finding a path to war. And so because it's harder, that means that it takes more cognitive uh, resources, more cognitive abilities. Um, and so if peace is an option, if in the problem space of those infinite, in, uh, infinitely increasing number of mathematical outcomes, if peace is an option out there somewhere, it's going to take exponentially more intelligence to find it um, as chaos goes up, which means that in some respects, if peace is something that you want AI to achieve or aim for, it needs to be smart enough to be able to do that. And so to use an example from nature, why do chimps go to war and why do lion, prides of lions go to war with hyenas? It's in part because of the structural incentives of food, um, but it's also because they're not intelligent enough to find another way. They're only intelligent enough to kill each other and that's about it. Um, and so the resorting to violence is often a result of lack of cognitive resources, lack of cognitive ability, and therefore you're unable to chart a path towards peace. And that is why I'm I am most afraid of a terminal race condition. If we can't ourselves be smart enough and we can't build AI smart enough to chart a path to peace, then we're going to go in the, the other direction. 
which is towards destruction or cruelty. And that is why I am most worried about terminal race condition above uh, literally all other problems. And it's the kind of thing that, based on the powers that I just outlined, seems like it is the most inevitable outcome right now. Because, again, smaller, faster, cheaper, dumber models are they're, they're, they're going to be used by default, and that's not a good thing. So a little bit of evidence to support this, to, to, to show that this is not just me operating in a vacuum. OpenAI's research with their weak to strong generalization, where they used a smaller, dumber model to supervise a more intelligent model, lowered the intelligence of that more superior model. Therefore, unaligned and unsupervised models um, have, an, have, a, have a structural and a performance advantage in terms of intelligence, which means that, okay, unsafe models have an advantage over safe models. Well, that's not good. Um, ideally, we'd have it the other way around, where the more aligned a model is, the better it is, the smarter it is. And of course, we've known this for a while. The Sparks of AGI paper, um, some of the research papers that were that were published by the people who had early access to GPT-4. Remember, the, the unaligned GPT-4, or the, 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 the uh, closed source one that nobody has seen outside of the research community, the raw GPT-4 is far smarter than chat GPT. Uh, RLHF makes models dumber. All kinds of alignment, as far as I know, all ethical, moral, and safety alignment makes models dumber, um, which means that unaligned, unsafe models have an intrinsic advantage in terms of intelligence, and that is a really bad thing for our future stability. Uh, and then there's also this recent paper about training deceptive LLMs, and this is where that, that assertion that larger LLMs are actually more vulnerable to deception, and they're actually harder to train out of deception. So again, deception might be an emergent quality of intelligence in that, and what I mean by that is that as models become more intelligent, as humans became more intelligent, we, uh, by, by virtue of the fact that we have the, the, the phenomenon of theory of mind, we're able to keep track of multiple narratives and we're able to keep track of the information content of multiple minds. Therefore, the ability to lie and deceive intentionally or otherwise goes up. Okay, so I've just outlined a nightmare scenario. So what are the mitigations? Unfortunately, the mitigations that I have come up with are not the greatest yet, uh, but I'm glad that those debates are happening, and this is why I do the work that I do. So there's a few general principles that we can think about in terms of uh, the researchers out there. So again, the, the primary thing is just recognizing that cheaper, faster, dumber models are going to be favored, um, and we need to be very, very cognizant of when we, when we exchange safety and alignment and guardrails for cheap, fast, dumb. There, uh, because of these energetic preferences and all of, and also these these competitive dynamics that that cause us to strongly favor uh, smaller, faster, cheaper models, we need to be very, very careful about uh, recognizing that uh, safety costs more. Like it costs more in terms of time, energy, and money. Um, and but we need to make that we need to make that choice, and we need to price it into all of the incentive structures that we build. Um, in terms of business, in terms of government, in terms of military, uh, we need to make the cost of misaligned AI far higher than the or misaligned or unaligned AI far higher than the than the extra cost that is tacked on for aligned AI. Um, and this is the same thing as like OSHA sa safety inspectors. Um, safety inspections take time, take money, take effort, but we make sure that the punishment for having your workers get hurt on the job is far higher than just preventing it in the first place. So from, from a risk mitigation perspective, we actually have a lot of established um, uh, system theory and principles in terms of, and game theory, in terms of how to achieve that, because humans are pretty chaotic too. Um, unless you create an incentive structure that says like, hey, uh, you do this thing, you're going to get punished for it. Like for instance, speeding. Um, speeding costs money. And if you do it too much, you lose your license. So there is, there is a negative outcome. There's a negative externality to speeding, which is priced in by punishing it. And so it's like, okay, well, um, I don't want those negative consequences, which means that you can incentivize the behavior that you want to see, which is drive safe. So speaking of that, structural dynamics. So there's two primary cardinalities that you can use to create incentives. One is rewards, which is giving, giving an entity or an agent something that it wants in exchange for good behavior or punishments, which is um, giving it something that it doesn't want or taking something away from it more like when it does something bad. And so in this case, when we're talking about autonomous AI agents 
Uh, you know, this is this is basically reinforcement learning where you have a positive reward. You give it a little carrot if the AI does something good and you give it a, you know, a little zap or a jolt or a, you hit it with a stick if it does something bad. Um, but that is at, that is model training time. There are larger uh, systemic structural dynamics at play here, such as the um, the incentives uh, that you need to use uh around companies, the behavior of companies and individuals. And so what we can do is we can uh, we can uh, implement accountability at all layers, which is basically like, hey, uh, a robot knows that it's going to get scrapped if it kills someone. Um, and the company that builds robots knows that it that it is liable if its robot kills someone. And people who use robots know that they are also liable if they use a robot to hurt someone, that kind of thing. And so there are structural dynamics and incentive structures that we can put in place that have to do with rewards and punishments, not just for AI models, not just for machines and robots, but also for humans and human structures and institutions, such as corporations, governments, and militaries, in order to uh, create an incentive structure that shapes the behavior that we want to see. But again, going back to the debate between Connor and Guillaume, um, there's not there's not necessarily agreement as to what those first principles should be. Now I got you covered. I'll cover. I'll I'll talk about uh, my proposed uh, values in just a moment. Uh, so, but before we get to that, I want to talk about swarm agents. So another thing that has emerged. This comes from Autogen. So I did an interview with um, with Microsoft uh, researcher Dr. Chi Wang, um, who is the mastermind behind Autogen. And so what we're finding is that division of labor in agent swarms actually increases the performance of the entire swarm. And so one, some of the stuff that he talked about was having agents that are, that are there specifically for quality control, for legal compliance, for ethical compliance, for safety measures. And by creating that division of labor, even if you're using the same model in the background, that, that agent layer on top of it that has different perspectives and different uh, areas of specialization, that actually seems to, to structurally modify the behavior of the whole swarm. And so this is one of the most interesting things that has emerged because the model itself, the underlying model, GPT-4 or Llama-3 or whatever, if you just think of that as a CPU, um, it's kind of neutral, like it'll do whatever you want it to. But then the software layer, the, the, the layer that is able to pursue goals, the layer that is able to uh, come up with objectives, and autonomously pursue um, whatever task you give it, the agent swarm, by creating agents within that swarm that have ethical considerations, that have long-term planning considerations, that have safety considerations, that actually confers unique capabilities uh, into the, the super organism that you're, created, you know, that you're creating. And so this actually stands out to me as one of the chief directions um, to research, which is basically you create a swarm and the swarm gets smarter over time, um, but you also make sure that the swarm is is designed in such a way that it will always have uh, certain classes of agents with certain uh, teleological and deontological concerns. So another thing um, is autonomous research. I have talked about this recently. We need to be, uh, in my opinion, we need to be thinking more about autonomous research overall. If you look at Max Tegmark's Life 3.0 and you say, okay, uh, fully autonomous machines, it's coming. Sooner or later, whether it's 10 years from now or 100 years from now, it's coming, and we are going to lose control of the machines one day somehow. Um, so in that case, the best time to start researching full autonomy is yesterday. The second best time is right now. And again, while we don't necessarily agree on all of the principles and, and, and uh, goals and values, now is a really good time to do the experiments because these machines are not dangerous enough yet. Remember, the destructive potentiality goes up exponentially over time if you agree with Connor, which I do in this case. And so that means that the best time to, to research safety is when the destructive potentiality is at the lowest. And of course, it was lowest years ago, but it's still very low right now compared to where it will be tomorrow and next week and next year. So one of the principles that I have talked about for a while, and it's been a while, so this is, this is something that I termed, and I call it axiomatic alignment. So the idea of axiomatic alignment is that we need to either derive, discover, or, uh, or craft or refine a set of universal values and principles that not only humans can agree on, but that humans and machines can agree on. This set of universal principles, if we can find it, if we can discover it, um, would be something that creates what's called a stable attractor state or a Nash equilibrium. And so in this case, the idea is, okay, everyone agrees on these universal principles and no one is incentivized to deviate from those principles, even if they can. And so in this case, the idea is um, to create, to find, create, or otherwise 
optimize this set of values or principles, this cluster of beliefs, these axioms um, that everyone can agree on for all time. And so this will actually solve a lot of problems, such as the Byzantine generals problem, which means that, hey, given the structural incentives and the dynamics that, are, that exist, we know that you're going to be, obey the laws. Um, this is why society works. This is why you can um, go into a store that when you, you've never met people and you know that you're not going to get stabbed and robbed is because we all have this social contract around the idea of if you misbehave, the cops will come and arrest you and take you to prison and you don't want that. Um, and so then as, as we humans all buy into this system, the system works. Uh, likewise, if we can create a system like that, that humans and machines can agree on, that is based on those um, those those principles that even though it's not going to be optimal for the individual, um, for the sake of getting along, you say, okay, I'll make some compromises and I'll give up a little bit of my freedom and a little bit of my energy and a little bit of my cognitive resources for the sake of getting along. And I know that everyone else is also abiding by these axioms or these principles or these values. And again, this is why you can have a nation of you know 300 million people, a billion people, and it doesn't descend into absolute chaos or anarchy is because it's a narrative that everyone agrees on, and it's a good enough approximation for solving the coordination problem. Another uh, component that makes it harder, though, is the idea that uh, many values or principles are non-static. Um, now, what I propose is, is a static universal set of values, um, but that might not be possible. Um, but uh, values are also contextual. So basically, the way that you make a decision, the way that you uh, decide on a principle or something that you value, it really depends on the context, and it also depends on um, recent events. So there is a temporal component and a contextual component in terms of doing values. Now, this gives rise to the possibility of maybe one of the layers in that agent swarm and the autonomous AI that we create is a moral operating system. And so a moral operating system would be predicated on moral graph theory, um, which I just interviewed the folks over at Meaning Alignment Institution. Um, and that was a great interview, by the way, so you should go check that out. But basically, this could be a moral layer that is in um, that is in all agent swarms. And I propose something similar to this with the ACE framework, um, but other people are taking these kinds of ideas and running with it, um, again, such as uh, Meaning Alignment Institute, as well as uh, Dr. Chi Wong over at Microsoft Research. Uh, but yeah, so this is another idea that is like, okay, if we can find a set of values and principles that we agree on, then we can also fight those, those forces that are going to push us towards a terminal race condition. And we can all trust each other that those set of agreed upon morals and values are good enough to solve that coordination problem and so that you can trust people in, a, in an otherwise trustless environment. And so this leads me to the set of values that I have proposed. And again, uh, some people have asked me, I don't talk about it as much anymore just because I realize that um, while, these, while these values are a starting point, um, I don't know that they would work, um, but I think it would be worth testing and exploring. So the cluster of three values that I have proposed are uh, what I call the heuristic imperatives. Um, and so basically it is a set of common ought assertions, um, to borrow the term from uh, that, that Connor used extensively in the debate. So this is basically making an assertion of this is what all responsible agents should uh, set to uh, as their as their you know arbitrarily incentivized goals or whatever, and so that is decrease suffering in the universe, increase prosperity in the universe, and increase understanding in the universe. And so the decrease suffering in the universe that uh, that serves to prevent that maximally bad outcome of you're going to live forever in a in, as a brain in a jar being tortured. Um, but at the same time, it also recognizes that as a cardinality, all living things try to, to decrease their own suffering. And I've, I know that some people say, well, but you need some suffering. I didn't say eliminate suffering. The wording is very clear here. I didn't say, I didn't say um, you know, reduce su suffering to zero. I didn't say eliminate suffering because there is an optimal amount of suffering and it is above zero because the, the best way to get to zero suffering is to eliminate all life. So I said decrease, um, not reduce or eliminate. Likewise, increasing prosperity, and this is where the accelerationists will probably agree with me, the goal of accelerationism is to increase prosperity as fast as possible. That we agree on, but again, we've also agreed on that uh, optimizing for a single value is, an, is a no-go. That doesn't work. Because if you just increase prosperity in the universe, and that's all you do, at what cost? 
Does that mean you increase prosperity without humans? Does that mean you increase prosperity at the expense of suffering or what? But if you have those two set in tension, because again, all humans, all intelligent entities and morally reasoning entities, nothing actually optimizes for a single value. Um, and so this is why I think that most of the arguments or debates that, that center or hinge around single optimization functions are intrinsically false. No human society has ever done that. No, no human has ever done that. Um, anyways, so the ability to handle tension between multiple values, AI can already do that and it's only going to get better at it. So you have decreasing suffering in tension with increasing prosperity. And then you have a third function, which is a more expansionist or transcendent function, which is to increase understanding, which this is what I call the curiosity function. And this is where I think that humans and AI will naturally align regardless of whatever else anyone does. And the reason is because humans are naturally cur curious. This was part of our evolutionary trajectory was to become maximally curious, which is why we send the James Webb ta uh, Space Telescope out to peer across the galaxy. It has no immediate instrumental or utilitarian value, but we do it anyways. Likewise, we build uh, radioisotope experiments and we, we travel the stars and we travel, we build boats and we go diving to the bottom of the ocean. Why? Because we're curious. Curiosity does have an evolutionary advantage for us. Likewise, I think that increasing understanding or, you know, truth seeking will also have an instrumental and utilitarian uh, advantage to machines. Plus, that's kind of what AI is for. It is meant to consume information and make sense of it. And so I think that increasing understanding is something that we can all align on. And I think that that's not a terribly big sell uh, to convince people of. But again, I think that I think that that one increasing understanding in the, in the universe, I think we're going to naturally align on that axiom Anyways, I don't think that anyone needs to do anything about it. I'm just pointing out, hey, look, this is something that we have in common. Now, one of the advantages of uh, my heuristic imperatives is, one, they're incredibly simple. Uh, reduce suffering, increase prosperity, increase understanding. It is very easy for those three principles to be repeated, to be explored, to be unpacked, to be written about, to be programmed in. You can write prompts about it. You can do reinforcement learning with heuristic imperatives. You can build it into uh, software architectures, as has already been done before. And so because it is easy to implement, because it is easy to communicate, because it is easy to test, that means that it is a solution that is exponential in nature. It's not complicated. It's not Byzantine, which means that if, it, if, if it's easy for other people to get it and understand it, then it has a better uh, chance of propagating. And so why is this valuable? Well, the reason it's valuable is because most coordination solutions that are, that are successful usually come down to very distilled principles. Uh, for instance, in the Western world, Equality before the law is one of the foundational principles that we believe in. Um, equality before the law is one of the central most assertions, uh, value assertions um, of Western uh, civilization. And equality before the law, um, that is four words. My, my axiomatic uh, assertion, my heuristic imperatives, six words. Reduce suffering, increase prosperity, increase understanding. It's not complicated. The fact that, that you can state an entire moral framework in six words means that it has um, a lot of utility. And then as I uh, alluded to the implementation of heuristic imperatives, it's not that difficult. Um, I've done reinforcement learning. I've done fine tuning with it. Um, it's been implemented in software architectures. It could be implemented in blockchain technologies as well. Um, so yeah, the, the options are kind of unlimited in terms of how you implement it. It's just another flavor of RLHF, which is reinforcement learning with human feedback. Basically, instead of tuning a model that predicts the whether or not the human will like it. You predict you 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 uh, train a tuning model that predicts whether or not the answer uh, abides by the heuristic imperatives. This is similar to constitutional AI, um, which is also kind of a well-established technology by now. Who okay? Thanks for watching. Um, this has been a long time coming, and yeah, I hope you got a lot out of it. Cheers.